taking a, a little bit of a, a step deeper in the search for alpha, we had a broader discussion with Jackie led earlier, which I thought was great, um, but really thinking about you know, this part of the market, which um, for some time hasn't had, uh, let's say, the most robust opportunities. Uh, um, you know, hedge funds have had a pretty challenging backdrop, really the last, let's call it 12 to 14 years, I think Art pointed out, it's been quite a period of time where, you know, we just not had that dispersion and so forth. So, Art, I mean, the whole point of alternatives as we define them, hedge funds, is that it is the one investment asset class broadly where you at least hypothetically have the option of getting alpha on the short side. Pretty much anything else you do in alternatives, private credit, private equity, real estate, those are all long biased, pro-cyclical, pro-growth strategies. And in years such as 2022, when both bonds and uh, equities sell off, pro-growth doesn't work. Now, we've gone through a bit of a growth research and so far this year, but ultimately, if you are concerned about um, catching the downside or benefiting from the downside or at least getting out of the way, whether it's through active trading or through the ability to short, hedge funds are unfortunately the only game in town. Not to say that they always do that, and I know Mark has done a lot of work, I'd love to hear about that, um, on the fact that there's not as much short alpha in hedge funds, and historically, they do correlate with risk on assets. That said, at least the option is there, at least the possibility to short for a CTA, for a long short equity manager, for a volatility strategy, that possibility is at least there. Mark, anything you'd want to add there? Or? Um, I mean, look, in terms of one thing that uh, there are many ways of adding alpha. Um, let me start by saying I think one of the best ways to add alpha out there, and this is, should be like blasphemy for a hedge fund manager, is putting together non-correlated yeah. alternative betas. I mean, really, that's your most consistent way of finding alpha if you can do that. Uh, you know, I'll admit we try to do it whenever we can because we think it's a very stable source of alpha. Another way of adding alpha that, um, that has worked for us at least is identifying different regimes in the market. Um, you know, uh, we back in 2004, we built the Conquest Risk Index, um, which told us on a daily and a monthly basis whether we were in what we consider sort of risk on or we call it risk seeking environment or risk off and risk averse environment. Then we went and looked at probably over 300 individual markets. And sure enough, we found that 85% of the markets we looked at showed a very high statistical bias, so it was performing in a very unique way in different risk environment. Then we took that analysis at one level higher and looked at strategies that traded those markets, and we found that 95% of strategies had a very clear statistical bias in terms of their performance. So once you have that information, it becomes painfully, painfully obvious that having a static risk allocation across risk regimes doesn't make sense. So moving from that to a dynamic risk allocation, ends up, and this can work at the allocator level, at the hedge fund level. At so, and Sabine, so do you have something there you want to add? Or? Yeah, a few things on this. Um, I totally agree with you on the, um, on the question of dynamic risk allocation. That's one area in which we're spending a lot of time. I think that beyond adding alpha, the first quality of having alpha is measuring it above zero, i.e. not deleting value from your portfolio, which is sometimes not a very obvious thing to do. So as, as a CIO, I guess that my job is not so much to parameterize or make the best individual strategy, but it's also to decide when to retire strategies, when to evaluate whether they have run their course, and when uh, the environment is no longer uh, conducive. So one may keep faith for a number of years, but after something has not made money for three, five years, obviously the questions become a bit more acute. A uh, key example, for instance, would be uh, FX Trend, which had been one of the engines of trend portfolios uh, before the great financial crisis. On the basis of liquidity, market efficiency, and the rapidity with which um, trends disappear because all these excess returns get arbitraged away, very difficult to keep this in the portfolio these days. So you can work at the individual strategy level, and you can work also at the portfolio level maybe through two dimensions. The first one is mixing up different types of forecasts, ensemble approach. I think it was mentioned this morning in one of the, uh, of the panels, trying therefore to reduce the uncertainty. And the second uh, approach in which I totally would echo what Mark has mentioned is to say, well, is there some predictability and conditionality here that I can exploit to make my portfolio construction a bit more dynamic? And if so, on which basis? What are the fundamental drivers 
in the economic environment between this and my portfolio returns? It's a very dicey question, very, extremely difficult to uh, disentangle. 